Uh, Webster Tarpley, fresh back from Damascus there in D.C., or I guess you're in Maryland today. Uh, Tarpley, tell us, tell us what you've seen. Well, I've, I've been in Damascus, as you've mentioned, and uh, in, in Homs, and in a place called Banyas, in, and also in Syria, which is on the coast. I've actually I've been uh, through the port city of Tartus, and this is now the place where just after I passed through there, we have the arrival of this Russian naval task force. I don't think they're all in the port. Uh, the port of Tartus has been uh, expanded and upgraded with some rather important uh, you know, additions to the facilities over the last couple of years. And the information I have, uh, one, one report comes from General Michel Aoun, the head of the Christians of Lebanon. I think a, a figure like de Gaulle, the savior of, of Lebanon, he told me uh, a, a week ago, uh, the Saturday morning, that the Russian fleet had actually arrived. And I got this confirmed from a Russian journalist, a woman working in Damascus, and it's a fleet that's composed of the Admiral Kuznetsov, which is a uh, an aircraft carrier, or at least a helicopter carrier, maybe a through deck cruiser, might be a, a term. Yeah, it's for like it. a troop carrier helicopter. It's kind of like the Coronado a Marine right. Corps ship. Right, and then we've got a, a heavy cruiser, the Moskva. The Moskva is a heavy duty, heavy cruiser with with uh, missile missiles on board. Three or four nuclear submarines, and the, the trick with the submarines is you don't know how many because they're they're underwater. Uh, if they come through the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles, if they were coming from Odessa and the Russian Black Sea Fleet, then they would have to surface as they go through the the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles because that's the the treaty, the Treaty of Montreux. I think says if it's a submarine, you got to come up to the surface to go through. But according to the uh, the Russian journalist I talked to in Damascus, she said that these these ships had come from Murmansk, so she said there were there were three or four nuclear submarines that were known, and maybe more, and I think also an anti-submarine warfare ship. Uh, so this I think highly significant, and I think the the big thing uh, that's that's hanging over all this is the tremendous hysterical Dr. Goebbels style Western media blackout that this Russian fleet is there. There are even other reports that they're unloading. These S-300 advanced surface-to-air missiles, the kind of thing that, that Gaddafi wanted, didn't get in time, the kind that, that Iran has asked for, and they still haven't gotten them, at least in the numbers they wanted, as far as we know, anyway, uh, that these are now being delivered to Syria. So this means that there's a whole new dimension of Russian support for Syria. Uh, two weeks ago, this past weekend, we also had the visit of the Russian Orthodox Patriarch, uh, Kirill, Cyril. So he's Patriarch Cyril of the Russian Orthodox Church, the top religious authority of the Russian Federation, at least of the Christians, and he came there to Damascus uh, to meet with the Grand Mufti uh, of Damascus, who was a very interesting figure uh, in his own right. I recommend you, you, you look him up. Uh, so the, uh, the idea is that you've got a pattern, and you've also got now uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov of Russia is saying we, we want you to stop with these ultimatums to Syria, stop with this stuff. He's responding to a French madman, Alain Juppé, the foreign minister of France, says it's time to cut humanitarian corridors into Syria and set up humanitarian... And that's corridors. a total repeat of the Libya and the humanitarian love bombs. And, and but, but you were there. We, haven't, we weren't able to get a hold of you after you were first on there in the sniper areas. And now right. it's coming out that indeed that is the Al Qaeda forces. Even the London Telegraph admits Al Qaeda is now taking over all of Libya. The, the, exactly. the, the, the military leader is a top Al Qaeda operative who openly says murder the Americans and all this. Well, That's his CIA cover. Uh, we've also got them at least 600 landing there. Uh, and then secondarily, now since you've been there, I want to hear about what you saw there bravely in areas under sniper attack, uh, Webster. You never like to toot your horn, but you've been in the middle of it. Uh, then I want to continue. Russia threatens to block NATO routes that they're using uh, since Pakistan's cut off their route into Afghanistan. What's happening with that base being bombed? By the way, Hamid Ghul is on tomorrow, folks. Former head of Pakistani intelligence at the start of the show. I wanted to just confirm that's coming up. Uh, also, uh, Webster, uh, we now have these huge explosions all over Iran, blowing up a lot of their missile facilities, killing their top commanders. Now the media is basically admitting the West is running operations there. Uh, the Iranians have hit the British embassy. I mean, clearly, things are escalating right now. 
Yes, I, I think you could say the Anglo-American mad dog imperialists are running amok. They are in a, a manic, hysterical war psychosis, a flight forward. Uh, it is. This is now a new surge. I guess we haven't seen anything quite at this level since about two. Webster, the MF Global is making forty to one bets, and 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 there's now statements in the news where they said that's just the way it is. Insanely, forty to one bets that were guaranteed to fail, losing twelve billion dollars in one day and just frothing around. I mean, the elite has gone totally insane. Yeah. And I, this is, it's good that you bring this up because this, this is, I think there's a certain causal chain. In other words, when you take a ruling elite like the Anglo-American financier oligarchy, these are finance capitalists. These are zombie bankers, hedge fund hyenas, and all the rest. Uh, they go nuts. They go bonkers when their derivative structures and their debt structures, their collateralized debt obligations and structured investment vehicles, when those go into ne negative leverage, into reverse leverage, and they start pyramiding astronomical, unbelievable losses at the top of these pyramids that they create, they go nuts. And they say, increase the rate of primitive accumulation, of looting, of sacking, of pillaging, of robbing, exploiting the world. But they, then they're told, well, there are these governments that seem to get in the way. There's the Syrian government that insists on selling bread for about 25 cents for 2.2 uh, pounds. One kilo of pretty good bread, I've had some, uh, for, for about a quarter. And they say, that's impossible. We want that to cost $25 for that kind of bread so we can send the money to Wall Street and the city of London. So all of these governments are, are in the way. And this has, been the, this has been the story of the whole Arab Spring. And then in the middle of this, uh, look at that band of territory that goes from Lebanon, Lebanon is now governed pretty much by an alliance uh, of uh, the Hezbollah pro-Iranian forces. Listen, I, let's hard, I want to get into all the geopolitical intricacies here, but bottom line, the elites are panicking. They're all going to go to jail unless they start World War III. I mean, and, but they're the boss, so that's just the way it is. But I mean, now, in, in the middle of all this, you've got to pick the one point when you have... When you have opposition forces, as we do, that are weak and disorganized and confused, there's got to be a clear trumpet. In other words, what do you do under these circumstances? What's the one point where activity, where uh, you know, a political assault, a political attack, can actually have, an, have some, some importance? Finance capital is the enemy. Wall Street is the enemy. The financiers, the zombie bankers, the hedge fund hyenas, this is what's behind the whole thing. Yeah, they're the opposite of free market, too. They're just absolute crony capitalist insider crooks who then are always given more power for the messes they create. Yeah, they, what they, they talk free market, but what they actually carry on is the fascist corporate state on the, on the Mussolini model. And again, this, this, the Syrian... The Syrian case is highly interesting. Yeah, so bottom line, you were there, the sniper attacks, all that stuff's coming out, it's staged. Are they going to have the nerve to start the love bombing, the kinetic love, and will all the trendies dance around and be happy? Look, uh, it, a lot depends on Russia. I would say just about everything depends on Russia right now. As, as Gideon Wells, the Secretary of the Navy, said in uh, 1863 and 1864, God bless the Russians. Thank God for Putin under these circumstances. Thanks, thank God he's making a comeback. Because if we had Medvedev with full power, the bombing of Syria and the civil war in Syria would already be going on. Notice that one of the things that's changing is the U.S. is leaving Iraq. That is, the large numbers of forces are, are departing. And what that, what that conjures up then is a belt of territory that goes from Lebanon to Syria across the, the uh, Shiite parts of Iraq and into Iran. That's basically going to be one continuous belt, and they're, they're opposed to the U.S. and the British, right? They don't like the imperialists for whatever, whatever reasons, and there are many reasons, and a lot of them are good reasons. So the idea now is if, if Iraq is falling away from U.S. control, and they, you can see it, right? The Iraqis refused to vote the sanctions against Syria at the Arab League. They joined with Lebanon, Algeria, and, and Iraq, said, no, we will not take part in the economic warfare against Syria. It means that that whole thing is meaningless. Yeah, because they've already enjoyed decades of mass starvation yeah, and, right. and, and loving <laughs> sanctions and they love love bombs. Privatized and everything. So... The idea now is they, they wanted, the whole idea was to attack Syria, so you'd isolate Hezbollah, you'd, you'd destroy the only ally that Iran had, other, other than Iraq. Uh, but now that doesn't, it, it seems not to be working. So 
I, I would just caution everybody, right? The Anglo-Americans are as mad as hatters. They're as mad as March hares. Look at them. They're all making 40 to 1 crazy bets. <laughs> I mean, I, I think they're going to start World War III. Look yes. how Cheney tried to start World War III with Russia uh, on 888 with the Georgia. But, but Tarpley, I want to go to break and come back. What about the Pakistan situation? What's up with them blowing up military bases now? Well, the, this is – we've had this all year, right? And we had – the U.S. Uh, pressure, of course, the U.S. threat is to seize the Pakistani nuclear forces, to destroy them or to, or to steal them, and, and set the stage for Pakistan being broken up into four or five parts. This is the longstanding scenario. Now, Pakistan has been fighting back. The first thing they got was that secret ultimatum from China about six months ago, where China said to the U.S., back off, you bums. We, we are going to treat any attack on, on Pakistan as an attack on China. Just now we've had the, the conference of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and there Putin has come forward as the personal sponsor of Pakistan becoming a full member, not just an observer, but a full member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Now you'd think a double guarantee for Pakistan would be enough. If China and Russia are both on record as supporting Pakistan, that ought to be enough to make the Anglo-Americans back off. But apparently not. Apparently they're so crazy that they're going to they're going to try to to drive this strategy home. They may think that the government is is weak or that there are other things they can take advantage of, but the fact is they've just killed 25 Pakistani soldiers. This is absolutely Well, they loved them. They love ah, they love bombed them. Come on. Now, now, going back to Webster, Webster, what I see from this, and Hamid Ghul agreed, former head of Pakistani intelligence and others, is it is a plan to break up the country in three to five parts, three, four, five. They have been caught the CIA trying to give radiation-type systems to uh, two al-Qaeda operatives that work for them to blame it on the government. Right. They're trying to break it all up. And so it's clearly deliberate they keep blowing up military bases and then saying al-Qaeda tricked them. Give me a break, folks. Uh, as a pretext. So what is it? Cause revolution in the country that is now happening? Is this just old-fashioned destabilization? Again, look at the, the ethnic breakdown. Uh, you have to see the, the, the ethnic origin of the troops who were killed, and often these are uh, they're sometimes Pashtuns if they're part of these uh, frontier militias. Uh, and the general idea is that if, if the Pashtuns get killed on the Pakistani side, they blame the Punjabis or the Sindhis for being part of the deal that allows the U.S. to go on doing these things. We've always got to remember, the U.S. is there because of the post-9-11 ultimatum. When uh, Colin Powell and our dear friend Richard Armitage told the Pakistani government at that time, uh, uh, President uh, Musharraf, they said, if you don't let us run wild over your territory and your airspace and your transport, we will bomb you back into the Stone Age. That's how the U.S. got there. And instead, they've been playing the double game of infiltrating, uh, taking over, uh, doing this. And then now they're saying, the Pentagon's saying, they're afraid the Pakistanis are going to launch terror attacks on America, then the globalist stage attacks, then they have a pretext to attack them. It's just pure poking the dog, trying to get the reaction. Right. And, and I think there's also an element of desperation because the, with the U.S. Uh, is basically leaving Iraq or largely leaving Iraq, there's always, you know, there's always a residue that they, they keep behind. The idea may be, oh, my God, we've got, to, we've got to hit Pakistan hard and fast and try to shatter the country because we may not be here, you know, in a, in a year or two. The other thing is, who's doing this stuff? Remember, the United States is not really run by Obama at this point, as far as I can see. There's this thing called the Principles Committee. That's Hillary Clinton, Leon Panetta. That's uh, Holder, the Attorney General. We know his, his multiple crimes. There's this guy, Donilon, of the National Security Council, and our dear friend, General Petraeus. And when I look at that attack on Pakistan, I say that has Petraeus written all over it. That's his signature style, right? Sneaky... Uh, you know, uh, betrayal, stab in the back, attack your ally, and then put on a hypocritical show, and so forth. And if All we right, stay there. I want to talk about where this goes in the final five with you, and then mention Europe. Here's the headlines. Europe on the brink. Eurozone looks to IMF for rescue. Oh, yes. Just incredible. Uh, finishing up with uh, Webster Griffin Tarpley, historian and also uh, economist. Uh, briefly, because we really want to hear what you have to say about Europe. Where do you see this going? Because, I mean, I'm really starting to get concerned. The elites are are insane. They are megalomaniacal. They have a plan, but 
uh, it, it is sheer madness, and they're going to run into countries that aren't going to put up with it. Yeah, well, that's what we're seeing with the Russian case, right? Today, uh, President Medvedev doing something that he didn't want to do, but Putin is making him do it, has uh, opened up, uh, you know, inaugurated this rather impressive-looking phased array anti-missile radar at the western edge of the Russian Federation, right? looking into Europe, and uh, they've got <clears throat> some short-range missile set up, so they're saying you want to put uh, your ABM anti-ballistic missile systems in Poland and Czechoslovakia and Romania and these places, fine, we'll, we'll put missiles there so we can blow them up in the first, um, you know, two or three minutes. So this is actually very big stuff. The, the part in Europe, of course, is, you know, astronomically bigger than even things in the Middle East, because in Europe you've got nuclear NATO and nuclear Russia, and if these clash, then that's, that's World War Three by anybody's definition. So uh, Russian resistance is stiffening. Uh, they, the Russians, of course, started late. It was a tragic mistake not to veto the Libyan resolution. That's, that's Putin. Uh, Putin is trying to pick up the pieces after Medvedev uh, made this mess. But uh, that is happening. And, and on the European side, the problem with the Europeans is they needed to strike against these agencies, right? We're now hearing that France is about to be downgraded, right? Uh, Belgium has been downgraded. Portugal downgraded. Uh, all of these agencies, right? Fitch, Moody. Yeah, as if the court. agency can downgrade a nation state when it's the right. banksters that have maneuvered the nation state into this position. Now they're saying, we say you're in debt servitude, and the government say, okay. I mean, this is pathetic. Yeah, that's the danger of a weak state. See, if you had a strong state, the strong state would say, guess what, ratings agencies? You're indicted. You're in jail. We're shutting you down. You're the tentacle of a foreign intelligence service. You're in the orbit of the U.S. intelligence community, because, of course, they are, and we're going to be investigating you. That's what General de Gaulle would have done, right? He would have had a tank parked outside the ratings agency very, very quickly, and that would have been the end of them. The other thing, of course, is if you're under attack through credit default swaps, and that's what's happening to Italy, for example, ban credit default swaps. Don't let the speculators use this uh, engine, right? The credit default swap is a way to increase the striking power and the destructive power of whatever speculative money you're deciding to throw at a country. So this is a, it's an orchestrated, it's a conspiracy. What other word for it? No, no, they're collapsing it finally into the IMF and World Bank and their private holders. Right. But and one, one, one comment, though, Tarpley, and I respect your, your view and your, your intellect. You keep saying America, Anglo-American establishment. We ourselves are kept slaves of the six big mega banks. So when you keep saying America, 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 uh, America is just another one of their holdings. We're just a giant engine uh, or, or a coal box they use to, to fund their system. But it, I, I tried to point out, we're talking about finance capital, right? We're talking about Wall Street and the city of London, and we're talking about their respective plantations. Now, if you don't want to be on their plantation, then, then you have to uh, struggle, right? You have to do something to get out of that. And quite frankly, a mass movement, right? You've got to, you've got to. But bottom line, people. they're losing control, so they're they might start World War Three. Right, but the, the point is, uh, we need, we need, to, we got some momentum with this Occupy Wall Street. I think that had some positive features. That's got to now. All right, we'll have to have you back up, Webster. Glad you got back safe. Phone calls, tons of news straight ahead. Stay with us. Uh, Webster Tarpley, fresh back from Damascus, there in D.C., or I guess you're in Maryland today.